and um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then what I would encourage people, we have some questions set, and if people have questions about it, um, we can, um, we've got an extra microphone, we can um, just hold up your hand and we'll, we'll come out and um, ask your questions, or you can ask your questions. Uh, uh, the other thing as well is if you have some input, um, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and um, provide some input. I think that, that will really um, add to the conversation. Okay, so um, based on the, um, the federal government's um, uh, budget, which is supposed to pass shortly, um, they provided a, a number, uh, a large number of funding um, towards uh, fighting climate change and electrification. Um, there are four pillars to this investment. Um, we're going to be focusing on the investment tax credit, which is the uh, second pillar from the bottom. Um, the lower you are on that on that pyramid, the broader the um, the um, the availability to participate is. Um, where at the top it gets really targeted and and you know possibly quite difficult to participate into it. Um, but yeah, the investment tax credit, which is the major portion, I can't really read it there. Um, let me just see if I can see it on. I can't see it on here. Um, yeah, so let's just jump ahead here. Um, I don't want too far. Um, the, as I mentioned, initially um, in the fall economic statement, the federal government, government announced a 30% investment tax credit for solar, which is really exciting. And um, there, when they came out with the actual budget, there was some confusion at first uh, because it's, it specifically mentioned 15% uh, as opposed to 30%. Um, when looking into it, um, it was pretty clear within about you know half a day or a day that the 15% clean electricity investment tax credit is really targeted for nonprofit. Um, and so like things like utilities uh, would participate in that typically. So their tax credit is a little bit lower than um, the private sector. The 30% is for private mainly. So businesses is, um, um, that, that have a rooftop, for example, they can participate in this. It also is uh, worth mentioning that this is targeted towards commercial systems, not residential. The residential uh, systems have, or the residential program is a different one. That's the Greener Homes Program, which is also quite lucrative and has uh, been quite successful. I think it was announced a year and a half ago or so. Um, one of the really interesting topics in it is that there, I there are certain labor conditions that have to be met um, within it. Um, basically what, what is required is that laborers um, on site have to be paid the equivalent of union dues. Um, so I, th I think they call it the prevailing wage and um, that is definitely causing some confusion with people, and uh, um, that's that's supposed to come in on. in October, correct? Sorry, you're not in. October first. Yeah. yeah, that's October first, correct? Yeah. Um, so what we will see, and we'll get into that, yeah. is that there will be some some um, some rush to get some projects built ahead of time, right? So, so yeah. Um, and yeah, so it was confirmed in the federal budget 2023. Um, I did a chart here that kind of outlines um, what we will see in this market. Um, take this all with a caveat. This is based on you know solar being 100% of the utilization of the ITC, um, which is not going to be the case. Uh, however, it also bears to keep in mind that, uh, for example, um, utility size projects will get a smaller portion of the overall funding. Um, so here we have um, the blue line would be the ITC budget. So for this year, so if you're looking at 2024, that's the tax year 2024. That's when, when projects will get their money back. Um, so that would be projects built in 2023. So in 2024, there are $800 million set aside for the ITC. Um, then uh, it goes up quite significantly to 2.2 million 
in a billion, sorry, 2.2 2 billion in 2027, which is going to be projects built in 2026. Um, we've also did a cost analysis on what a typical commercial solar system costs. Year one, right now, $2 a watt, going down to uh, $1.70 a watt or $1,700 per kilowatt peak um, installed. So then we looked at how much is actually going to be built with this money. And for year one, we're looking at 1 1.3 uh, gigawatts, which is quite a bit, quite a jump versus what we've seen. I think Canria has announced that it's like 600 megawatt that we're built in Canada last year. So already we're seeing a doubling of the market this year, going up to 2.4 gigawatts next year with the $1.4 billion in funding, 3.5 uh, gigawatts in uh, 2026 and 4.5 gigawatts in the fourth year of the ITC. So that's quite that's quite a big ramp up, obviously. Um, and there's some challenges that will come with that. So we're going to get into the question and answer section with um, Jason here. He's going to ask us some questions. And um, Mike and I will answer those. And then also, again, if you have um, something to contribute, please um, raise your hand and we'll, we'll let you ask those questions or, or contributions. Hello, hello. <laughs> so we'll uh, start off the questions here today. And of course, yeah, feel free to sort of raise your hand, jump in as you need, so you fit. <coughs> so. Uh, what are the main benefits of the new tax uh, credit for solar, uh, and how will it impact uh, the solar industry? Yeah, you can, you can start off. Okay. Yeah. Since I've done all the talking so far anyways. <laughs> um, so obviously the major contribution is quite obvious. It reduces the return on investment for the end customer. I think that is always quite interesting, and we're always looking to to do that in many different ways, right? So an investment tax credit is one of those tools on how to return, uh, reduce the return on investment. It's Sorry, yes. <laughs> that's right. No, exactly. LCOE goes exactly. Down, increase. Yeah, no, if you want to get minus, uh, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Re exactly. Then, um, obviously, it's a sales feature, right? Yeah, it, it, it looks like we're going to have a doubling in year one, and uh, not quite a doubling for every year after that, but yeah, for first year is a doubling. So that's that's a major, major increase and a major change to the market uh, over, over the entire country. So it's not just provincial, right? So we're going to see a, a huge change in the landscape of solar in general. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, creates urgency, right? Like we always try to, as a sales company, like if you're selling solar projects, you're trying to create urgency and... Yeah, I mean, we've been working with distribution for the last six to nine months since this has been getting thrown around and trying to anticipate what will happen and what we need to do and put in place to make it happen. And uh, Danny's been working with us pretty diligently to try and create forecasts to anticipate what that's going to look like. And so all of you together are kind of working with us to try and make sure that we have product when we need it um, because we're, we're all going to be very busy, which is great. Great news for the solar industry. The last thing I wanted to mention, actually, that you know I just thought about it the other day is um, it's actually really good um, from a messaging standpoint because it incentivizes the provinces to participate in this. So our conservative government in Ontario, for example, which has traditionally been anti-solar, um, they're now you know, all of a sudden kind of looking at this and they're like, okay, we want to be part of this because there's free money to be had, right? There's, there's job creation and they don't have to touch their own budget for this. So it's really exciting from that standpoint as well. It's, it's huge on the job creation side and it's not a short-term thing either. It's, it's a long-term incentive program. So, yeah, it's it's going to be major across the provinces. Yeah, do you want to pass the um, microphone over there? To My name is Zafar. I want to know, like, uh, is there any more detail about that investment tax credit? Like, what's the 
is there any threshold or like what's the rate or how much we can? Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? So basically what you need to do in order to participate in it is you need to be a business. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not for the private sector, uh, for, for a homeowner, for example, yeah. right? So it's uh, commercial. Like, for example, this building would qualify because Frank and Solar is a business, right? Uh, as far as maximum size, I don't think there's anything in there about a maximum size. Um, and yeah, so if, if it gets into utility, for example, then I, typically it would just get reduced to 15% because of, you know, it, um, it being generally um, utilities being involved in that, but there may also be some some that are at 30%. But yeah, generally, I think there's very little restrictions in it, which is part of the exciting thing about it, as opposed to what we're used to in Ontario, specifically with the feed-in tariff program, right, where we always had the 500 kilowatt AC limits and um, for, for a small commercial, and then there's some other limits on the resi side, the 10 kilowatts, right? Um, yeah, and I, I think on the utility for the 15 as well, it's just partially based on scale, right? Because you could you could quite easily see uh, the fund being gobbled up pretty quickly on utility scale. If we are like, uh, if we are exporting those solutions, like solar solutions, we can avail that also, our company? W what are you doing, sorry? We are exporting those uh, solar solutions. Exporting it where? Like, what are... Like Okay. Yeah, it's only for our projects in 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 Canada, right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. So if when you put put a grid produce energy and then that's turned into grid and then not used back in the utility. It is for both utility and and and. For the utility, it decreased to fifteen percent. Correct. Right. Basically, yes. And then, uh, is there a limit from from what um, cost of the project you can own? Like, if I let's say that it's a small commercial thing, like really small. Yeah. I think there's a minimum amount um, that that you have to have to do. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm not sure what it, the exact amount is, but there's it, it it's it's fairly small actually to participate. Okay. I so I think a 50 kilowatt will qualify oh, basically, okay. something like that. I don't know the exact number. I think we've got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the tax credit is supposed to end 2027, right? The the initial funding okay. that has been provided in detail is till 2027. The program is supposed to run till 2034. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was just wondering because um, the whole idea is like to the whole idea is to like promote, you know, get more people to embrace solar and all that. But uh, one thing I found out is um, when you know, like the, there's an incentive like this, more people embrace solar, and the demand goes up. Yeah. And if the demand goes up. The prices of electrical equipment, so like electrical equipment, also goes up as well. So we will we will talk about some of that. There will definitely <laughs> be some supply and demand. Some of the other questions will be about that topic, and that's definitely in the short term something we need to to keep in mind. I think long term, um, I think the prices will still reduce, get reduced, right? But okay. just because of technology inno innovations and things like that. But but yeah, we'll get to that for sure. All right, that's my question. It's a tax credit. There's a tax write-off as well, okay. but it's a tax credit specifically. So you get 30% off your tax bill. Um, so how does this new investment tax credit um, differ from previous uh, incentives uh, for solar energy? And what are some of the key features that make it more attractive, um, Danny? Like yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, I think uh, in this case, primarily it's it's a, a federal incentive and it's it's long term. So it's not sort of a here here today gone tomorrow provincial incentive that uh, is is hard for uh, you know municipalities and provinces uh, to kind of get behind long term, right? So in this regard, uh, you know, it it, it it's going to be around a long time. And uh, it's it's something also that manufacturers can get behind too. So in Longi's scenario, uh, we we look at this very 
intensely and say, okay, this is something that's going to affect the market uh, long term, and how do we make sure that we can support that properly? Whereas if it's a provincial incentive, uh, then it's really hard to kind of flash in the pan and, and make ready for that. Um, but something like this is, is definitely uh, what we keep our eye on uh, for Canada. Yeah, I think, I think the longevity of it is really exciting, right? For manufacturers specifically, it makes it much easier to invest into a country. Yeah, to predict. Yep. Yeah, yeah and to, to ensure supply. And I mean, the same goes for solar installers, right? Or for Franken Solar, for that matter. Um, being able to plan long terms, uh, uh, long term, which just allows you to invest in in people and in infrastructure, right? So we 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 should be able to just everyone will 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 grow from that, right? There was a question, I think. Um, is there any limit on success sizes? There is no limit, no, that I'm aware of, anyways. I think I hadn't heard if there's a limit either. Bilal. Um, yeah, so uh, that's a great question because it is a budget. It hasn't been approved yet, right? So um, the NDP and the uh, Liberals have a coalition going, and the uh, NDP has already said that they will support this budget. So this will get passed. There is no doubt about that. But thank you for the question because this allows for a lot of clarification because that is always a worry at first, right? Yes? Yeah, I think it's based. Yeah, sorry, I think it's it's based on uh, on a number, and I, I'd have to look it up what the exact amount is. I think it's really small. It's like ten thousand dollars of funding or something like that. So it'd like be like a thirty thousand dollars system. I, th I don't know the exact amount. Maybe someone else here knows it. Uh, we can definitely look it up um, and and get back to you on that for sure. What are some of the potential challenges that a solar installer uh, may face in taking advantage of a new investment uh, tax credit? And how, in the past, can they overcome this? Um, obviously, like there's a pretty big ramp up here. So um, I think that's, that's um, you know, something that um, is going to cause some challenges. And maybe Mike can elaborate on, on some, of, some of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it comes back to the planning uh, again uh, that we've been doing with, with Danny. Uh, we, as you can see, the impact is probably <coughs> going to be a doubling uh, this year. And you've seen in previous years uh, what that looks like when there's a blip in supply. And so we tried to be as proactive as possible and start planning for this actually last year. Um, and, and we keep working on forecasting all the way through uh, to ensure that we're going to have supply. So the biggest things and, and takeaways would be making sure that you plan as much in advance, probably looking at um, you know your stocking orders to be double uh, what, what they have been in previous years, just to ensure that you're going to have product when you need it. It's pretty, pretty key. And, and we're doing the same thing with Danny. Danny's doing tons of planning in the background to make sure Probably make sure that your your wattage uh, ranges that you're looking at for your your modules are kind of within a fairly norm, as opposed to looking for peaks or or, or bottoms. Uh, you want to make sure that you can get product that's readily available uh, in the marketplace, whether that's laundry or otherwise. Um, keep it within a, a standard product offering as well. So standard product cell is starting to move over to M10 uh, from an M6 cell. Uh, so. You want to sort of start planning around things like that to ensure that you have a good product supply long term. Um. Yeah, especially with, we'll get back to you in a second. Um, especially short term, I think there will be a really big ramp up now uh, because there is a provision in the budget um, for uh, labor requirements. Um, and a lot of people that sold projects, they may want to build these projects before those labor provisions come into play. I hinted at them that they're basically based on um, the prevailing wage or like union labor wages, right? Which is quite significantly higher than what a lot of solar installers are paying their laborers, right? So 
that date is October 1st, and I would expect that we will have a big rush right now um, over the next few months to get sec uh, equipment secured, which is going to possibly cause some shortages short to medium term in the supply chain. Does, does anyone know uh, if it's installed or whether it's an application based for October? It's any labor, actually, that is, that is done before of or on um, okay, so it's the uh, actual before October 1st. Yeah, okay, any labor. it's the labor itself. Okay, Correct. so it has to be an installed job. Yep. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yes. So as far as the IDC, is it applied to the actual product and the labor to install? Like, you know, whether it's pipe and wire and et cetera, et cetera, is it, a, is it across the board or are they separate? It, it is supposed to be the full turnkey cost that's associated, so that includes development, sales cost, everything that goes with that. Yes? Do you have data on what the union labor rate is? And is that an attrition rate, or is that sort of used to generate the cost? Yeah, that's, and that's where there's some confusion, right? Uh, and I was Level part of a webinar yesterday with Ken Ria on that subject. And Ken Ria doesn't know for sure. A lot of even the really large developers that are doing wind and large solar, they're not sure either. So that's why there, there is definitely a lot of confusion. Um, so there's two parts to the labor as well. So there's the prevailing wage, and then there is the 10% um, 10 percent of the people working need to be um, um, apprentices in a red seal trade. So that's another topic that you know may cause some confusion. Yes, but the requirements is 10 is 10 percent. Yeah, they are requiring a minimum of 10 percent. So yeah, I think you can go up to I think two to one, right? Uh, by by law. Um, and I think there may be some companies that are taking advantage of that because I don't think they have to pay an apprentice the same way that they would um, some someone that is a red seal um, tradesperson, right? So um, there's definitely um, some some advantages there to save some money for sure. Bilal. Yeah, that's a that's a huge, huge issue, right? And I think we're getting into that in a little bit of a later uh, slide as well. I think there there is, um, you know, I think structuring your your agreement with your customer, I think, is key, right? Um, don't just be like, well, you know, five percent down, and the rest when the project is completed. <laughs> um, and I mean, we've seen stuff like that, right? I mean, definitely. You know that happens um, typically more in the residential side of things, but we've seen we've seen some commercial, you know, installers do similar things. Um, definitely not recommended because it's going to cause um, uh, cash flow issues, right, for the company that does that um, when there's a lot of growth. Yeah, yeah, I would I would definitely say uh, plan plan on not absorbing that uh, for your customers. <laughs> Uh, so we've sort of touched on this already, but um, <coughs> what are the expected shortages of? Uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. What are the expected shortage of product in the Canadian market, and uh, how can solar installers insulate themselves from equipment shortages? Yeah, I think Mike touched on a lot of that. I think I'll just summarize again um, from my side. I think. It's really important to order as soon as possible for projects that you know you have. I think that's really key. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's us or if you're buying from one of our competitors. I think it would be smart to do that because um, I do expect there being shortages. Um, hedge, like if you know that you're quoting five megawatts of projects and or you're, you're likely to get five megawatts of projects, but you can't really commit to five megawatts of ordering because some stuff may fall through, or order a portion of it, order a quarter of it, right? At, le at least you got some stuff secured um, 
and you can keep your, your crews busy, right? And you can keep building. Um, the worst thing that can happen is not having equipment and you have tradespeople that are just sitting around or you're missing out on install season and now you have to build in the winter, right? Where We've all done that, but <laughs> it's not a lot of fun. Um, then, as Mike mentioned about the multiple pr uh, products that... Yeah, like try, try not to uh, gear your projects around peak peak wattage modules, uh, you, you, you can, uh, certainly, but you need to <coughs> probably have some type of caveats in your contracts with your clients uh, to suggest that it's going to be within a certain uh, range or, or power bin class. So if you're quoting in the, you know, f 72 cell that are bifacial and they're 540, 545, you know, just kind of leave it, leave it within that range, uh, as opposed to saying they're all going to be 545 or something to that effect, because it's, it's just difficult uh, when there's that much ramp up in a market uh, to say that you're going to be able to get that peak wattage all the time, and typically uh, it, it doesn't make a huge difference on the client side. They just want to make sure that they're getting within a range, and, and a price per watt. And then also planning around products that are available from multiple vendors. So if we're talking panels, right, we're talking about planning around something with an M10 cell. I mean, there's Longi that has an M10 cell, but there's other vendors that have an M10 cell. Don't use something that only one manufacturer produces, right? It has a cell in there, like, it's just very ran, like, very unique. I would not plan around that, because if that company has shortages, now you're going to have to go back to your customer, and you're going to have, like, a difficult conversation at times. If you're using inverters, if you're using a string inverter, use something that is easily available, right? There's there's a couple of string inverters that, you know, that are easily available. Um, uh, microinverters, same thing, right? There's some microinverters that you know, similar similar types exist between different manufacturers. Would not recommend using a uh, string inverter plus optimizer that is only available from one company. That doesn't make a whole bunch of sense because if that company has issues with the supply chain which we have seen then you're just SOL right like it's it's very hard at that point to to keep your guys busy um, and then the same if you're doing racking I would if you're doing a flat roof system use something that is available or design around a 10 degree system because most companies have a 10 degree system right or all of them basically don't do a 30 degree customizable stuff like that it's just not you know if that, if there's supply chain issues you're going to have a hard time getting that product and you're just going to sit still and can't build projects yeah yeah like most m10s are going to be within millimeters of each other so planning around that for a flat roof is usually pretty pretty easy to do any anything natalie So clarity exactly on, on how you file, I'm not sure yet. I, I would have to make some assumptions on how that is done, right? Um, what I would expect there to be in place is you, you know, there's going to be a field in your tax return where you can put in some sort of, disc, uh, some sort of, of um, write-off, and then they may audit you. I think that's my gut feeling on how they will do it. And they're probably going to audit a fair bit of stuff, uh, projects, right? Um, what is really good about this is from you as a solar installer, you have to do less upfront work. Where the problem comes in is you may have to do a lot of work after you sold the system and installed it, right? They may come back to you and you have to prove certain things to the government, such as the labor requirements, for example, right? Um, that, that would be the challenge. Yeah, you have to exactly help the end user. The, the person you sold the system to, they, they will require some additional information probably. Yeah, and I imagine that audit process is probably going to be standardized too. So, you know, if, if you do get audited or if they make it a standard thing that they're doing, it's probably also just going to be uh, a fillable 
type paperwork with addendums that you can put for attachments. Bilal? Yeah, tra I and yeah, track all costs. Obviously, don't don't miss anything. Yeah, yeah. Especially, we're looking forward to seeing some clarification around the labor rules, right? I think that is really important. It's um, going to be huge. It's going to be big. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a I think there's a website you can find out the prevailing wage. Um, I think um, Daniel from Power Tech he told me about it. I don't think he's here yet. He should be here. Um, later this uh, this morning, I'll ask him for the website again so we can share that uh, on our LinkedIn page or something like that uh, with everyone. How do we see the new investment tax credits impact overall competitiveness of the solar industry? And what implications might that have for the broader energy market? Do you want to jump on this or me? Or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's not the question. On the board. I don't think that question. I think I took that question out. But no. uh, you, you, can, but you can jump on it, Danny. Yeah, <laughs> it just I think overall, I mean, it's really exciting already. What we've everything is dropped. I think um, it's really exciting what we have seen over the the last ten years happening. Anyways, in the solar industry, right? I mean, we used to be the expensive solution out there, right? Um, five, six, seven dollars a watt installed, um, very expensive solar systems, right? Um, everyone was like, oh, solar is expensive. It doesn't make any sense. We've, even without this ITC, I mean, we've come so far and solar is the cheapest form of electricity globally now. Like, I think it's, it's, it's crazy um, how far we've come and it's only gonna get better. Now you add a 30% ITC on top of this and it's really exciting. Um, I think it's a no-brainer for most companies to install solar with this ITC. I think if you're selling solar, I think it's going to be an easy sell. Uh, an immediate doubling. And, and we're seeing that in, just in Alberta, where I'm living now. Um, it, Alberta has gone, you know, ballistic <laughs> as far as uh, solar installed. Um, and, and you're getting all kinds of utilities and oil and gas companies jumping in. Uh, left, right, and center. There are projects that are sitting on the fence, and this uh, tax credit will definitely put them over the top. And w we're talking very large projects, you know, 50, 100 megawatt plus projects, and they're they're going to move ahead just because of this. Uh, and that will happen as a rolling uh, prospect across the provinces for sure. There are any qu other questions? Or yes. somebody to deal with this on an ongoing basis starting today because you're going to have to apply for this credit. You're not going to be able just to ask for it and get it. You're going to have to have justification. You're going to have to have documentation as the other gentleman said. That brief dot has got to be brief dot, 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 whatever you, you do. And it's a big deal and it's really helpful and many companies screw it up because they haven't got somebody appointed to deal with it. And they aren't depending on you manufacturers and other distributors to help them with the process. So you've got a big opportunity in the marketing sense to actually help the cloud deal with this issue and make it successful. Yeah. There's a lot of organizations in the IT world and the telecommunications screwed around with this for years. In fact, many of them gave up because they couldn't get it organized properly. And the government was very difficult to deal with on the issue of DJEC, how you actually get the credit, how you get the money back. And the other guys said, you're about this is a this is a bank issue. You're talking about working capital and how long it takes to yeah. get the working capital return. And you've got to plan for that in your, in your how you put this out. 
how you use your customers to actually accept it, and how you would train your customers to not expect that they get an automatic 30% discount because you got an IPC. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you there's a huge set of issues here you guys can help with. You better start now because the government is medic hasn't got straight yet. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of details come out in the next short while about this budget. And by the way, the labor issue is a red herring. Yeah. That's going to go on for the next three or four or five, ten years. And get used to that one, too. But all I'm trying to say to you is you've got an opportunity to lead here. And I would suggest you do it. Yeah. Uh, and that's what this is all about today. I, I came here to learn from some of the stuff and what we're doing. But this is a big opportunity. But it'll get wasted if you don't do it right. Yeah. That's all I'm trying to say. Appreciate the feedback, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Karen Dixon from the Department of Politics. And my question is regarding energy credits. Uh, some of the energy credits they have used as a revenue stream in justifying renewable energy projects. And uh, I haven't seen anything in the IPC that would say, say, who retains the energy credits. Is it, is it traded over to the government? Or is the, um, the developer still owning those credits? Because it, it, it's a huge Generally, I find that government projects are such, incentives are such, that the government gives something and takes something back. Yeah. And then this is the, the red herring in the whole system, is who owns the energy credit? The, there is no word that I've read in the budget that yeah. talks about that specifically. So in that scenario, I would assume, and I know it's always dangerous to assume, that you would keep those. In Ontario, I don't think those are you can do very much with those, because we have a very net um, carbon uh, neutral uh, grid, so we don't, uh, traditionally we haven't been able to do anything with these carbon credits. Um, however, places like Alberta, for example, it's a, a different huge discussion. impact, yeah. Yeah, so if, if it's not mentioned, it's a very good point. Um, I remember in the past, in the late 80s and 90s, when we were developing natural energy and biogas plants, uh, the government did provide some incentives, but in return, they took away the energy credits. Yeah, and the same was the case, for example, with the uh, feed-in tariff program we had in Ontario um, back in the um, early, you know, what was it, 2011, 2012 to 2015 or 16. Um, all those projects, the government, the Ontario government owns the carbon credits. Um, but this specific program, as of right now, I have not seen anything that's, that specifies that. Um, Yeah, definitely. Good, good point. Uh, uh, definitely, should we check. will reach out to Ken Ria on that subject so they can then find out. All right, to the final question that we have for today. So, what lessons can be learned from other countries uh, that have implemented similar incentives for solar energy, and how might these be applied in the context of the new investment tax credit? So, I think Bilal already. Um, did you leave? Uh, Bilal already was kind of mentioning it. <coughs> Sorry. Um, it's fast growth, meaning like cash flow is going to be key, right, for solar installers and people building these projects. So, you know, grow within your means, I think, will be one way. Uh, make sure your contracts with your customers are structured in a way that you're not financing the project for them up front, right? So, those would be, and I know it's like it's much easier to sell, obviously, if you're telling everyone they have don't have to pay um, anything until the project's completed. But reality is, you know, your business gonna grow significantly if you're looking into participating in this or the greener homes program. Uh, you know, we see issues all the time across the country. You know, these days because the, the renewable sector is growing so fast. So, and a lot of companies are growing fast, and sometimes they don't think long term right like how, like it's not that you're not making like a profit but there's also the the, the cash flow side of things is, is huge right so that is something to always keep in mind yeah yeah if you're used to you know financing or working on two two projects at a time and now it doubles to four or five projects what does that look like for your labor uh, stream for for your cash flow in general and just management of the projects to making sure that you don't make mistakes um, is, is a big deal and, and obviously coupled in with um, product supply, right, which is part of where we come in. 
Yeah, and I mean, even for us, I mean, we, we also have to grow within our means, right, as Frank and Solar. Um, and cash flow is always a topic, right? So we would like to have 100 megawatts of solar panels here and, you know, inverters and everything, and racking, but, you know, that's not always, yeah, I'm sure you would like us to have that many here. Um, but that's, you know, you know, not always very smart to do, and that's why we will have some issues in the summer, I think, because if we, like, if we order, you know, 110% of what I think we will sell, now if we're, you know, only selling 50% because there may be some delays of whatever, now it's a huge cash flow issue, right? So that's why it's important that if you have projects, you order, right? So we we can order for you as well, and we can allocate product. So uh, in in this time, it's it's really, really important that that we all work together and make sure that that um, equipment is available for you. Yeah, interest Point. rates are, are obviously Co high as well, right? Cash. Yeah. I uh, just want to ask, uh, has anybody uh, seen movement on any projects uh, with with the new tax credit versus previous years? Yes? Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's still the that's still the case. They're both. You can use both of them. So you can still uh, depreciate your project over, yeah, one year, if you want to. You can you can apply for both. Yeah. Yeah, so what you can do with your solar project, and you've been able to do this for about four years, is you can uh, depreciate your asset, your solar project, in one year if you want to. You can uh, uh, write it off 100% in year one if you like to. Um, so that's already the, in place. You can also decide to do it over four years, depending on w how, you know, how much profit you made as a company and how you want to apply it, you can do that. So you have complete freedom on how you want to do it. Nat? That's a great question. Did someone give you that question <laughs> to ask? It was really? <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's man. a great question. <laughs> and it's actually a really important question, and I should probably should have brought it up. Um, I think with normal taxes, there's always uh, the ability to carry over. So it, it, if, if that's the question. So if you're not I actually using have the it answer for it. Uh, the answer is that you can get it paid out. So the government actually will send you a check. Oh, really? However, you have to be careful because now it's taxable income. So you have to tax it the following year as income. So that is that may I'm not sure about that. I would assume that they just want to pay it out, but that's maybe need some more clarification, right? So, but I know that they will pay it out for sure, and that's also with the fifteen percent uh, credit for um, um, non not for profit businesses, for example, right? They will get that fifteen percent paid out. Awesome. Anything else from anyone? Excellent. Well, that was awesome. Thank you, everyone, for the input. Really appreciate that. I think that was that was really good. Um, I think we will have some more time on the trade show floor now. Thank you, Danny and Franken, and everybody for coming. Yeah, yeah. much greatly appreciated, and thanks.